Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. I'm your host Sri Ayer. Today I have with me Pandit Satish Kumar Sharma ji from across the pond. Pandit ji, namaskar and welcome to P Guru's channel. Pranam ji, namaskar Sri ji. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, my apologies for my absence but uh, as we go through the conversation you will see how busy the British Hindu community have had to be for the last few weeks. There is so much happening and uh, a great chance to catch up. Yes, indeed. And uh, there are four topics that we're going to be talking about today. The first one is going to be on the debate on grooming gangs that took place in the parliament. The second one will be on China, their human rights versus uh, Uyghurs, as well as the source of the, the Chinese virus. The third topic that we are going to talk about is the CAA or rather the anti-CAA narrative being pursued by a few and how India's government is sort of not really uh, alive to this. And the fourth and the most important thing, in my opinion, we're going to talk about is Greta Gate, the fake narrative gang, how this has spread its tentacles across the world and how it has quickly bounced back to try and shake off everything that has come out in the last two days. So a very, very interesting conversation up front. And we are going to look at all these things from the lens of a United Kingdom as a country because this is not now located or isolated to one part of the world. All these things seem to have a, you know, just like the virus spreads across the world, all these narratives also have very, uh, you know, sequenced uh, narratives that uh, with, with sequenced timing that they seem to be happening around the world. So Satish ji, what happened at the grooming gang uh, debate in the parliament and uh, how are things going there? Has the truth started coming out? It's a great subject to start on, a tragic subject, but a great subject nonetheless. Um, I think it's probably worth introducing to our audience that this issue of grooming gangs has been on the political agenda for the best part of 30 years. So this is a long time. There have been parliamentarians and um, social workers, people reporting the horrific crimes that have been uh, inflicted in this manner. And so this particular debate is really important because it's a debate which was brought to the chamber by the general public. The public raised a petition, over 100,000 people demanded that after the release of a very partial, inadequate Home Office report, we talked about that last time, 100,000 plus members of the, uh, the British public said, we want a fuller debate on this issue. And it was a wonderful act of um, democracy in action. It was great to see the British public's voice having reached to uh, parliamentary chambers. When the debate actually started, it was quite remarkable to notice a clear split between two perspectives. And it's, I would go as far as to say that this clear sort of uh, difference of opinion between the two perspectives is actually going to become the a defining feature of this issue. We are now going to be able to see, and the public will start to accept this, that there are voices who want to con conceal the reality of this issue and voices who are now beginning to define the, the circumstances, the precise nature of this issue. And um, I've actually got uh, a couple of recordings of the chamber, which I think uh, will, will demonstrate the point. So uh, if you can, Sriji, I think our viewers would uh, we really benefit from seeing the two perspectives at play here. Yes, indeed. And viewers, now we are going to play the video and we will connect again and resume our conversation after we play this video. Tamaji Singh Dasi. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Any debate on grooming gangs must start and end with those who have survived it. They and their bravery to come forward are the reason we even know about this systematic abuse. They are the reason we have secured convictions. They have survived horrors beyond imagination, a drawn out routine of vicious, violent abuse, sometimes lasting years. We know from the Home Office report that survivors are most commonly females aged 14 to 17. The main risk factors are being in care, experiencing episodes of going missing and having a learning disability, also drug or alcohol dependency, mental health issues and experience of previous abuse. In other words, 
the very people that our society should most protect, they are the ones that are being most let down. To say that we have let them down is an understatement. Like many of us here, I am a parent of two young children and have lovely nieces and nephews. I couldn't bear it if one day they too were to become victims. We must prevent these horrors from occurring to any more children in the future. I welcome the report, all by dragged out of a hesitant government, but following its publication, the Home Secretary said in a written statement, and I quote, motivations differ between offenders, but that a sexual interest in children is not always the predominant motive. Financial gain and a desire for sexual gratification are common motives, and misogyny and disregard for women and girls may further enable the abuse. Offenders can come from a range of social backgrounds, some of whom uh, have been stable middle-class professionals, some of whom were married, whilst others have had more chaotic lifestyles. The one thing that would hamper efforts to tackle group-based child sex sexual ex exploitation is to falsely claim the criminals belong to only one religion, one ethnicity or one race. We know this is fake news and official independent statistics attest to that fact. And these falsehoods are exploited by the far right to create racist divisions within our society, perpetuating myths and stereotypes. People like the English Defence League and Britain First using the images of survivors against their wishes, organising marches, stirring up hate online. It's not about conforming, Madam Deputy Speaker, to political correctness. But if we adopt the language or assumptions of hate groups, we fall into a very dangerous trap. The devastating reality is that sexual abuse can happen within any community, be it white British, Sikh, Hindu, Muslim or other backgrounds. Our priority should be ensuring that victim support and services are accessible and available, not spreading misinformed and prejudiced beliefs. And I know from local communities in Slough that sexual, uh, child sexual exploitation, in addition to racist scapegoating, are real concerns, which is why I have raised this with our Slough police commander, the council leader and chief executive to ensure that we are working collaboratively and that we are minimising the risk of this abhorrent crime affecting our community. If we are misdirected and end up looking in the wrong places, then we fail to tackle this head on. And the current level of prosecutions is just not good enough. And funding for support organisations is nowhere near enough. Let us be clear, this is about patriarchy and power. Discounted, dismissed and dehumanised, not only by those who rape them, but also by the authorities they turn to for help. We all have a moral duty to end this abuse and make sure that the evil perpetrators feel the full force of the law. Thank you. And for a different perspective, let's hear from Tim Lawton, Member of Parliament. Now we go to Tim Lawton. Tim Lawton. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's difficult to encapsulate in four minutes something that I spent many years as formerly a children's minister in campaigning against, because back in November 2011, we launched the government's child sexual exploitation uh, action plan in collaboration with The Times, which had long campaigned on this uh, subject, with Bernardo's and with the Child Exploitation and Online Protection Centre, who published their report out of mind, out of sight. And we worked with police, with children's social care, with children's charities, uh, and importantly, with children and young people, the victims and parents themselves. And it followed the high profile series of prosecutions and convictions after the Derbyshire Police Operation uh, Retriever, which brought this subject to the newspaper headlines for the first time. And it was almost a year before the dramatic Savile revelations, which opened the floodgates for people to be aware of the presence and extent and historic reach of CSE. Now, the action plan highlighted that CSE can happen anywhere to anyone not something exclusive to northern metropolitan uh, boroughs or people from estates on the other side of uh, town, or just by to troubled girls, as some honourable members have, have mentioned. I met survivors of CSE from the families of doctors and lawyers and middle class backgrounds and heard their deeply harrowing accounts. Now, I mentioned the CEOPS report, Out of Mind, Out of Sight, because this and all these reports had uncovered a systemic and systematic culture of neglect, secrecy, and in too many cases, willful complacency to call out the issue of teenage white girls, in some cases boys, 
being sexually abused by British Pakistani grooming gangs. It was a taboo subject. It was swept under the carpet. The victims often regarded having asked for it uh, disgracefully. And the insidious tentacles of political correctness often suffocating action. So we set out an action plan. Above all, was our call for urgent action based on complete transparency, encouraging survivors to come forward and speak out and to put the whole shameful problem firmly on the nation's radar. The following September, the Savile revelations broke and every day the media was full of accounts of CSE across celebrities, religious institutions, schools, and so on. Virtually nowhere was immune. And there was a fear that the original phenomena of organized CSE of primarily teenage white girls at the hands of these predominantly British Pakistani grooming gangs was going to be sidelined by the prominence being given to others. That was despite a catalogue of such cases from Rotherham, Rochdale, Telford, Oxford and, and well beyond. So it's a real disappointment, Madam Deputy Speaker, that we are today having to debate an issue based on the lack of transparency about the extent of the systemic activities of these grooming gangs, which are still going on. And I appreciate that most of these convicted for CSE are middle-aged white men, many acting alone, but the phenomena of organized British Pakistani grooming gangs is a specific and dangerous criminal activity and needs to be called out for what it is and tackled in a very specific way. So why on earth are we having to debate now why maximum transparency has not been applied to research into how these gangs operate and how they are still getting away with it, because this is not just historic, it's still a contemporary problem. The problem of secrecy and culture of denial within certain police forces was again brought to the fore last year with a new inquiry announced by the Mayor of Greater Manchester into the abandonment of Operation uh, Augusta. If we are really to get to grips with a specific issue of grooming gangs, then surely we need to delineate it as a specific sexual offence, distinct from other forms of sexual offences, and for that we need to be open and transparent with all the research already undertaken and to undertake more if it's needed. We've had the Jay report, we've had the Louise Casey report, and the former Home Secretary, my right honourable friend, the member for Brensgrove, uh, produced uh, his own uh, uh, report, or commissioned his own report, which seems to have been downgraded and morphed into an external reference group consisting of several honourable members. The former Home Secretary launched the original inquiry. He intended it as a comprehensive and definitive report on child grooming, published in full and with uh, volume. There will be a no-go errors of uh, this in inquiry. So why has this research and report become a no-go error? We owe it to the victims and the survivors to publish in full. Satishji, this is just absolutely mind-blowing in the sense that I am, I should say, utter disbelief. One person, he is speaking for the victims, he's on the side of the victim, and the other person is just speaking to his vote bank. Mr. Tanmanjit Singh, what is wrong with you? You have to represent the entire constituency, and if some of your constituents are wrong, it is your job, it's your duty, nay, it's your responsibility to tell them that what they are thinking is wrong. You have to lead. You are the member of parliament for the I mean, uh, entire constituency. Well, yes, uh, Sriji, it's uh, particularly hurtful for anybody who knows the history of Bharat and uh, especially the Punjabi community and the wider Hindu community who took up arms at the instructions of Guru Gobind Singh. You know, anybody who knows the real history that Islamism was such a terrible problem at that time and the records are, are very clear. There are many, many Arab scholars who have written about the atrocities that were inflicted at that time. And when Hindus took up arms, they called themselves the Khalsa. The Panjpyare were from all over India. They were all Hindus. Guru Gobind Singh himself was his uh, family lineage, you know, Janeu Dhari. These are things that are uh, historical facts. And the Hindu community have never really spoken about these. We've just allowed a dominant rhetoric to actually establish itself. But I think we're going to have to speak about these things. And when you know these things and you hear Tanmanjit standing there in the chamber and articulating his point of view from what seems to be a political strategy without adequate compassion for the huge number of victims of this particular heinous crime, it's a real, it's, it actually makes me feel quite um, sad to see this. Uh, the, uh, the gurus would not uh, give their blessing to this. But you saw equally that um, there are now parliamentarians who are willing to actually name the anomaly that is so visible in the statistical evidence. 
And that, I think, will increase. I think this one petition, which was raised by the British people, will be seen as a turning point. It will be seen as an instruction to Parliament that you've, dr you've dithered, you've dragged your feet for so long on this particular issue, and it's now got to change. And I think there are enough parliamentarians now who are finding the courage to be able to say, let's put any issues of political correctness to one side. Let's put issues of not wanting to be seen or risk the charge of being accused of being racist or religiously discriminating. Let's put all of those things to one side. We have to focus on the fact that there is a vulnerable group, they have been systematically targeted, and in fact it's still going on today. Most of the viewers won't know, but the police force, which uh, is... Um, Many of these crimes have occurred in many of the towns which are within the scope of one particular police force, Manchester Police Force. There has been a shift at the top of it. The chief um, constable has resigned, and it is under government measures. The government home office team are actually now running campaigns and research and trying to conduct investigations to um, bring this thing to a close. And I, I think we have to also just give a shout out to the Home Secretary, uh, Priti Patelji, because this would not have happened under another Home Secretary. You know, I think she has had, she's dis displayed the courage to grasp this particular thorn by the neck and to, she's determined to deal with this. So that debate is a big leap forward for us, but it, um, I hope it really does send a message out to the community that this issue needs to be addressed and uh, the government needs to be supported in its efforts to deal with this one particular issue. Um, um, Satishji, one thing that bothers me a little bit is that some of the communities that were greatly affected by these grooming gangs is our Veer Hindu community, also known as Sikhs. And for Tanmanjit Singh Ji, who himself happens to profess the same Panth, to somehow not acknowledge that is utterly shocking. And As, yeah, I know you're, you're absolutely go right. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sorry, you can see that from over there. Um, I was part of a small number of people who were interviewed by the BBC, and we we pressed them for a, a meeting. And I was there. Lord Indrajit Singh was there. There were members from the Pakistani Christian community who were there, and we were presenting evidence to the BBC research team which proved that this issue had been affecting um, the Hindu community and the Sikh community and that we'd been reporting it for decades to the police, to the BBC, and nobody had listened. But now that um, people had lifted this stone and found that actually this was disproportionately affecting the white working class uh, girls in uh, mostly in the, the north and the middle of England, the BBC came to talk to us about it. We provided them with unbelievable quality data uh, going back decades. And would you believe it? At the end of it all, the BBC decided not to air the program. And so the Sikh community has got charities. We have our dear Mohan Singh Ji, who has been working on this issue as his life's mission for at least um, 15 years that I'm aware of. And yet we have Dhanmanji standing there as though this as though the emphasis should be completely elsewhere um it is a huge disappointment for us we were we were very proud to see a turban in the debating chamber you know it was a a, a cause for punjabi celebrations but i, I really fear that uh, the the joy that we had is rapidly turning towards disappointment and i really hope that he doesn't um in any way shape or form diminish the respect that uh, the tradition he bears has uh, in the public's eye and indeed in uh, India's history. Panditji, I have a question. Are there not some British Pakistani origin uh, members of parliament also? What did they do during this debate? Well, you've um, hit on a, a very good point. Their voice was absent. We have uh, in the past seen very vocal, strident, shrill anti-Hindu, anti-India, Pakistani origin um, speakers in the house, but on this particular case, there was almost a muted silence from them. Um, and I, I think it's getting to the stage where people are recognizing that the hard facts, and the data that is being presented, 
cannot be covered up by rhetoric. It can't be sort of concealed by lashings of um, emotional um, appeals and uh, misdirection and deflection anymore. And so their voice was completely absent. Um, quite shocking. Now, um, see, this is, this is where uh, someone's responsibility as a representative of the people, as a member of parliament, that responsibility is, is uh, you know, showing, you know, uh, there, there seems to be a priority challenge for some of these people. First of all, you are a member of your parliament. The, 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 uh, you, are a, you are a member of the parliament. You are the leader of the constituency. You represent the entire constituency. And if there is truth to be told, it must be told. And they and you, being a member of the same community, you should be telling the parents who are you know the, the the people who did these things you have to change your ways you have to face the law and if you did something wrong you have to be punished for it and make sure that you don't do this thing again this has now become such a big uh, you know in terms of numbers it's a big issue that you know you you cannot put a carpet over it and for them to just remain utterly silent i hope the majority of the british pakistanis who are watching this understand that they are not helping anyone they 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 are actually showing or making the painting the entire community in poor light and i think it's for them to choose the right leader to represent them in the parliament i'm of course ranting a little bit here but i'm just pained because this community doesn't deserve this kind of treatment well sriji the the harm is universal you know, everybody who is in this particular space is tarnished by this. One of the parliamentarians spoke so eloquently, and he said that the Pakistani community doesn't deserve this, that this is a minority within their community, but the whole community is risking being tarnished by these allegations. And so, you know, it, it's an issue that harms everybody and does nothing. It, it gives nobody any benefit except, I suppose, the parliamentarians. You know, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary thing. The Chamber of Parliament, the debating chambers, they're places where facts and evidence are presented, where an issue is scrutinized with courtesy, with respect and calmly. And on the basis of that, the best members of every community who are sent to Parliament, they sit and they come to an understanding and then they come to a decision and legislate. This is the manner in which parliamentarians are supposed to work. But what we have seen over the last four or five years now, especially over the last two years, is as though the parliamentary platform has become a place for pantomime, you know, a place where you can make um, outrageous allegations and deliver them with fiery rhetoric and um, glaring eyes, etc., etc. But everybody knows that people who use that strategy generally don't have the data to back up their position. And that, uh, that, that is an untenable situation in the long, long term. So hopefully we will see parliamentarians reverting back to the old, um, and my honourable friend, etc., etc. You know, all of these formalities were architected to maintain a particular way of engagement and scrutiny. We, we really do need to see it reverting back to that. But having said that, on the basis of the last two or three debates, in the last week, we have had, last two weeks, we have had three debates which are all focused on India. And they are so biased in their presentation. And equally, um, the, the parliamentarians are guilty of uh, rhetoric and grandstanding and amateur dramatics and theatrics, etc., etc. But the consistent theme is if it vilifies India, Indians and Hindus, and then let's talk about it in public and amplify it using a parliamentary platform. If it's any issue whereby India is shown in a good light, let's not talk about it. And if we can talk about anybody else who we can project as a victim of India, Indians and Hindus, let's really amplify that as well. You know, on the one hand, we have the world in awe and many many um, genuine um, commentators expressing gratitude, courtesy and respect for India's vaccine diplomacy, as it's being called. You know, the, um, the, the leader of the Brazilian government 
tweeted an image of Hanumanji carrying um, Sanjeevani Buddhi as a as, as a gift. That was that was a wonderful gesture for a, the leader of a country to acknowledge such a historical and religious impact uh, effect and um, incident, and to express that gratitude. And on the other hand, we seem to have here in um, Britain uh, a core group of parliamentarians who aren't aware of that. They're not uh, wishing to give any credence to that, but what they are doing is looking for platforms to denigrate India. And I have to say this, there is one consistent theme, and that is that if you want to attack the Hindu civilization, if you want to attack the Hindu people and the Hindu diaspora, wherever they are, what you do is you attack Modi, you attack India. You paint those as in, in the worst possible light, but everybody should really recognize now that these are actually attacks on the Sanatan Hindu dharmic civilization of that uh, of, of that part of the world. It's becoming so clear. We had a, a debate on the, shall we say, the persecution of minorities in India. Okay, this was a parliamentary debate, and by by implication, that means that Hindus are persecuting minorities, although they were clever enough not to mention the word Hindus. What they were doing was amplifying and projecting that Christians, that Muslims, etc., are unsafe in India. And they're trying to build up an argument to project this. But it was horrific. It was completely discriminatory. Panditji, uh, I think everybody who takes this line should be reminded of one of the first resolutions of Neset, the Israeli parliament, when it got formed. They said, of all the countries that Jews went to, there was only one country welcomed them with open arms, and that was India. Thank you, India. And, and, and that should be told, that should be retold. I hope the Indian consulate and others remember, they need to go back to the archives and find out what was the resolution number so that it gives a certain authenticity to what I just said and mm. say that this was the resolution that the Neset passed. Remember that in 1948, it was a piece of land and Israel was staring down the, ar the barrel of a gun every which direction they turned, except maybe for, uh, for the sea. And, and uh, the, the, the important thing was that country knew that there was, if there was one friend in the whole world for the Jews, it was, the in, it was India and in the, the Sanatanis. And uh, there are many such stories, 91 Sri Parsis. G. Yeah. Yeah, we should talk about, you know, the children are not taught these histories, but I think we should also respond by talking about these issues in very public places. You know, the Sanatani civilization has never invaded any other country. Yes. You know, we are, we are talking about what Indians are doing within India, what Hindus are doing within uh, Hindustan, right? And yet for a nation which has never invaded any a country, which has on record universally welcomed human beings as fellow brothers and sisters of the human family with open arms and not being too concerned about their ideologies, we attract a huge amount of vilification, we attract a huge amount of denigration. And I think part of it is because we allow it. I think we have never had um, the appreciation of the necessity to rebut false allegations, but we do need to accept that as a strategic requirement of the time. Unfortunately, uh, the, the truth of the matter is that some of us who happen to come from the same roots choose to not mention it, especially when we are taking our oath. I can understand one Bible, it could have been one Gita, but no. Yeah. Very, very, very unfortunate because I'm going to remember this for the rest of my life and, and I, I will make sure that it comes up at the most inop inopportunate moment for somebody who did this anyway that's that's a matter of a different time uh, i think that particular that particular story is going to generate such uh, an amount of commentary shall we say in the years to come there there is a a mountain of um, of inadequacies of inconsistencies of hypocrisies uh, it's just uh, going to generate more and more difficulty for many people but um, uh, just uh, to reinforce what you were saying, we do need to start to assert that our identity, that our civilizational identity, is actually a valuable heritage of humanity, and that it's something that should be nurtured and protected in the best spirits of freedom of religious belief, 
as opposed to continuously criticized and uh, Hindus uh, Hindus probably should uh, reject being harangued um, more vocally now more vociferously but um, if I was just going just going to conclude on the parliamentary uh, issue we had three debates all to do with uh, India uh, to do with attacks on minorities to do with religious freedoms um, etc 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 um, but there is one glaring discrepancy of any an, an example of an incredible discrepancy so in one of the recent debates it was about the persecution of minorities in India okay and in that whole debate the persecution of Hindus in India was not mentioned and we know that institutionally and constitutionally Hindus are discriminated against within their own native homeland and yet it wasn't mentioned in this debate. They didn't say in this debate that it's unreasonable for Hindu temples to be contributing of their donations to the public purse when no other religious institution does. They could have said that. They chose not to. But if you look at the flip side of the debate, when it was CAA, the Hindus, the Indian government, um, Modiji directly, were vilified and pilloried because they were allowing fast-track citizenship for minorities who were persecuted and because they hadn't mentioned the word Muslims. And there was a global campaign of vilification against India, but when it comes to the flip side, they don't notice Hindu persecution. And it's a, an incredible um, demonstration of a complete and utter political hypocrisy. Well, you know, some of these people don't seem to read the fine print. India also denied giving refugee status to all the Hindus who came from Sri Lanka. And they've, they've all been sent back to their homeland because the challenge, the tensions have died down. It's now 10 years since their civil war ended and everybody has been sent back, barring maybe 50 or 100 people left in India. So they did not get citizenship. So, you see, this is all... You know, <laughs> an, a narrative that is being done to cloak the systematic elimination of minorities in Pakistan. And looking at Pakistan, it has started happening in Bangladesh as well as in Afghanistan. I might as well say this thing, Satish ji. Uh, um, about six to eight months ago, a group of 21 senators in the United States have written to the then Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, uh, saying that the minorities in Afghanistan, namely Hindus and Sikhs, comprising about 1,100 in number, they should be fast-tracked to bringing them to the United States at the most earliest time, uh, in, in, in the shortest amount of time as possible. And the signatories are Senator Bernie Sanders, Vice President Kamala Harris, at that time a senator, and many people from both sides of the aisle, both the Republicans and Democrats, have signed this letter. And, and I still don't have any update on this, but mm -hmm. as soon as I do, I will let everybody know. So on the one side, we have this very uh, un unusual situation in the uh, United States. On the one side, the senators belonging to the Democratic Party, and now they are in power, are recognizing that minorities such as Hindus and Sikhs are being discriminated in Afghanistan, yet they are allowing their city councils to pass this anti-CAA <laughs> resolution. I mean, folk tongue, is that what it is? I don't know. I, I wish somebody would tell me what exactly is going on in the minds of these people. I mean, this, this is again another vote bank uh, uh, gimmick that's being done. But anyway, we, we, we are digressing from our topic, which is now. So these are all fake outrages on something that is totally 180 degrees from the facts. Now, let's take a look at some facts. What's a fact? That the virus has originated from China. What else is a fact? Human rights abuses in Uyghur, again in China. Does any of these people want to talk about it? What are your it's... impressions, sir? You're absolutely right. I don't recall that there have been multiple demands for a parliamentary debate on the Uyghur situation. Right? These um, Labour parliamentarians who wax lyrical on this issue, um, they're not uh, raising the same level of anti-China um, criticism as they have been against anti-India. And this is a stark 
um, comparison, which I think everybody can make and everyone can understand that there are other elements at play here. And it's, um, it's worth asking the question, why is this happening? What we have actually seen is a global targeted campaign with one intention, and that's the incitement of hatred against Hindus. Right? This is the, the common thread that runs through all of this. It was targeted, it was created, it was fueled, it was funded, it was generated. We're living in a world where one tweet against a particular community can get you dismissed from your employment, your career can be ended. And yet, on the other hand, we now see a global campaign of incitement against Indians and Hindus, and nobody is batting an eyelid. Everyone's assuming that it's all genuine. This is how propaganda works. I'm sure that some of our viewers will have come across Goebbels' work, the work he did for the Nazis, where he said, if the lie is big enough, people won't believe that it's a lie. A small lie doesn't achieve the objective. So the lie has to be absolutely huge, and the human mind will just acknowledge it. And what we are, being, what we are seeing now is the orchestration of the big lie against India and against Hindus. We have to recognize this and deal with this. Yes, and uh, I hope that that recognition happens soon and the Hindu has to stand up wherever he is or she is and stand up for what they believe is right. And there is so much in our Shastras that tells us about how these challenges are uh, faced and, and rebutted. And in fact, Bhagavad Gita tells you just about everything that you need to know to, to you know, combat these kinds of fake narratives. Uh, Pandiji, we are uh, running a little bit behind on time, so I want to just go to the next topic. Now, this Greta Gate, this was one <laughs> instance where we saw how these people have, you know, scripts that everybody adheres to, and in a time-synchronized fashion, everything starts erupting at the same time. The farmer agitation that doesn't seem to have been undertaken by the farmers that has been that has its funding, its roots, its genesis in Canada and in United States and in UK. And there are some lumpen elements. And I am gobsmacked to note that a certain singer by the name of Rihanna was given $2.5 million to put out that one tweet. First of all, who has that kind of money to splurge? And and I, I hope she counts her money. That some some of that might be counterfeit. Uh, anyway, <laughs> the, <laughs> jokes apart. So this greater gate, this now I think finally Indian government also is beginning to act. Um, what are your thoughts on how this is playing out in the United Kingdom? And mm. is the is the Indian consulate uh, taking a more proactive approach to try and disabuse people of their notions? Uh, let's just uh, dissect this issue a little bit more. Firstly, I think there are going to be two casualties of this whole issue. And the first casualty is well, Greta Thunberg, she's a child. There is no way that a child should be allowed to be participating in such violent, turbulent landscapes. This is not a place for a child. And her parents, uh, I, I really think they should be reflect upon what they have created and what they have exposed their child to. There is a serious issue there. But I think the, the larger casualty and the greater tragedy is actually going to be the Sikh reputation. This is a casualty which we are now beginning to see appear in front of us, but it was entirely predictable. You know, here in the United Kingdom, we had schools which were run by the Sikh community and held in high regard. The Sikh community has been held in high regard. And yet what we're now seeing is how tragically they became sepoys, how they were incited, how they passionately took on this whole cause without their elders saying, stop for a moment, let's dig a little bit deeper. You know, is this actually a situation where we are being weaponized and turned against our own ancestral homeland. Somebody amongst that whole community should have been asking these questions because it was apparent. You know, Jallianwala Bagh, we, are, we, we remember it with horror, but we often overlook the inconvenient fact of history that those guns were on the shoulders of our own Indian sepoys. You know, those bullets were fired by our own Indian sepoys. I remember with um, 
a bit of a, an inner wince. The, the famous line from Lata Mangeshkar Ji when she said, Ghar ko lagadi aag, ghar ke ne. And I think as the dust settles and the hand of the funders who paid um, this uh, film star plus other pseudo celebrities, as that becomes revealed, our passionate Sikh community, Punjabis, uh, they need to sit back and reflect on how they have been leveraged and perhaps used um, to target their own family. You know, it's a common acceptance, isn't it, that Punjabis, we have, um, we are, we're often accused of having um, too much josh and not enough horsh from time to time, that we act out of passion and courage and all of those things, but it also makes us vulnerable to being manipulated. And I think this is going to be the case. We are going to see more and more evidence become um, available and become presented, which will establish the, the, the terrible um, leveraging and manipulation of our own courageous community. When, when you look at the facts, the farmers' laws, they're actually laws that have been passed. Many of the, many of the acts and the, the clauses have been passed um, by previous governments as well. People have been talking about farmer suicides for the last 20 years and nobody has done anything about it. This is the first, first government who reviewed all of the past legislation, found much of it to be very good legislation, even though it was passed by Congress and uh, other past administrations, and then decided to act on it to stop this farmer suicide situation. And as a result of that, all of a sudden, everybody has targeted, has seen this as an opportunity to weaponize one of our own communities and to point it at our own selves and to target them. And this, I think, will be the second casualty. Um, the casualty, uh, it will be tragic when Hindus decided to take up weapons in defense of the Sanatani Dharmic civilizations. They called themselves Sikhs, the students, the, 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 warrior, um, the warrior saints. This was an incredible uh, attainment, a civilization deciding it needed to protect itself in this manner. And those people who made that sacrifice, who accepted the responsibility of defending dharma at the expense even of their own lives, we've held them in the highest regard. But I really do feel that to some degree that reputation will be the, the largest casualty. And the wisest heads in the Sikh community and the Hindu community should really come together and decide on how to repair the harm that's been done and how to preserve and protect our community because ultimately the dharmic civilization of Bharat is the target of these forces. We have a story to tell. We have the story to tell of our own enslavement, of the atrocities that were inflicted upon us by two waves of the most horrific colonial ideologies that have existed. Those stories haven't been told and the forces that still run those two colonialist ideologies they don't want those stories to be told. And what, what I think we have seen is probably the world's greatest implementation of a classic divide and rule strategy. You know, those brown people should fight those brown people. And yes, we'll sit on the sidelines and laugh. But there are tragically people and power structures which leverage that and do follow that philosophy. We really do need to show greater wisdom and protect our own national assets. And the Sikh... Um, culture, our Sikh community, is one of our greatest national assets. We really do need to protect them and they also need to step up and protect the, the, their own history and indeed the, um, the gratitude which uh, is always placed at their door. Very sobering thought and uh, I think uh, we need to all reflect, calm down and see the bigger picture here. And thank you Panditji for sharing your uh, experiences of how things are unfolding in the United Kingdom. And, and again, we are still in the midst of a pandemic. It shows no signs of slowing. And instead of, uh, uh, you know, trying to combinedly battle that and get that out so that we can all resume our normal lives, all these debates, they are trying to find some new instant, new uh, reason to try and deflect people's attention away the main problem here is how to, uh, you know, combat pandemic virus. And um, thank you very much, sir. If you would like to summarize something or if you want to say something, please feel free to go ahead and uh, otherwise we can call it a wrap. 
Uh, Pranamji, Suji, I think we've covered many of the most important issues that yeah. needed to be talked about. I think the, the closing remark would really be a reminder that all of us, we invoke the Shanti Mantra, which is about tranquility, tranquility, tranquility. And the widest members of all of our communities really must leverage tranquility now. It's time to step back from the frontiers, from the, the barricades, and step back and genuinely reflect on what we have done, how it has been done, and what really is best for all of us and our children and our communities in the, the months, the difficult months still ahead of us with regard to this particular pandemic. So yes, wise words to conclude on. Thank you, Sriji. Namaskar, and we'll be back again with uh, more updates from across the pond. Thank you, Panditji. Pranamji, Om. Thank you.